Hello, everybody. So today we're going to be talking about the best 100 movies ever made as told by the Critics 2022 site and sound poll. For those of you who keep up with these kind of things, you'll know that the list came out in December of last year. So this is like eight month old tea, hardly breaking news, but I got around to watching all of the movies in the top 100 that I hadn't seen yet, and I wanted to make a video talking about them all. For some context, the Sight and Sound poll started in 1952, and they've released a new version of the poll every decade since then. So over time, it's become one of the more standardized, uniform methods we have to track critical consensus over time. I think it was Roger Ebert that said that Obviously, when you're talking about best movies of all time lists, none of them actually matter. None of them mean anything in terms of objective merit. But he said that if any list is going to matter, it's probably this one. It's the most comprehensive, it's been around the longest, it's esoteric, it's pretentious, and supposedly it features the most educated pool of voters. Supposedly. And this poll actually means a lot to me in terms of how I got into movies in the first place. I discovered the list in 2013, which was just a couple months after the 2012 poll had come out. So I realized I had basically a decade to wait until the new one would come out. And now here we are, and I've watched everything, and I have a lot to say. And I don't think anyone else online has done a video like this where they talk about each movie individually having seen all of them. So I'm taking this opportunity to lay down the gauntlet with the most knowledgeable, most comprehensive, canonical interpretation of this list. Because if not me, then who? And if not now, then when? This is me pumping myself up because I'm realizing that even if I only talk for one minute about each of these movies, that's still like two hours of material. So I don't want to waste any more of our time. Let's get into it. Okay, so I have this list here, which I didn't create, by the way. I found this on tearmaker.com. So don't yell at me about some of these poster choices. Some of them are kind of bizarre and I don't recognize them. So we're going to try to figure this out together. But basically, I've created these five tiers and we're going to rank all these movies. And this gives me an excuse to talk about them all. And for the record, when I'm ranking these movies, I'm not ranking them in a vacuum. I'm doing it in the context of their appearance on this list. Like, pretty much all of them would at least rank as good on their own. They're well-made, they're well-crafted, etc. But I don't think that would be interesting. Like, we have to have a top and a bottom. So I'm going to try to make this almost turn out like a bell curve, where everything is relative to one another and we have the outliers in the positive direction and outliers in the negative direction. But even the movies that are going to rank in like the bottom 10 here, I don't necessarily think they're bad movies. It just means they're the worst out of this list, or maybe I don't think they deserve to be on this list, but you get it. And I recognize this format is like begging for outraged comments because I can already see people being like, oh my god, he put insert very well respected movie in the flop tier. This is absurd. This whole list is ridiculous. Which like, whatever, I get that I'm opening myself up to that. But this is my opinion. We can all be adults. Honestly, make your own list. I'll probably watch the video. So let's get into it. We're starting out with a bang. This is one of the most influential movies ever made, Breathless by Godard. And Godard is one of these directors that is going to show up many times on this list. I believe he has four movies, and some of them are more well-deserved than others, but I think this one is very well-deserved. I have no hot takes here. I love Breathless. It's a movie that really does feel like a new era. Like, it's so kinetic and still feels thematically modern today. Like, it just feels so cool and designed for a new generation. I always think of that moment of Belmondo looking at that image of Humphrey Bogart, like wistfully staring. It's just breathtaking, a breathless. <laughs> so we're going to put this in love. We're starting out on a high. Next, we have The General uh, from Buster Keaton. This is a silent movie that I do enjoy. Uh, there's some really impressive stunt work here and 
physical comedy. It's essentially like one long chase scene. It's almost like Mad Max Fury Road in that way, where you spend half the movie going in one direction and the other half of the movie doubling back in the other direction. And it all pretty much takes place on a train. So it's some crazy practical effects here. I think there are definitely silent comedies that aren't on this list that I like a lot more. Uh, I've never fully connected with this movie. We're going to put it in meh. It's like a high meh or a low good, but I'm trying not to like sit on the fence with these things. So we'll put it in meh. It's still a good movie. It's still important, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But we're moving on. Okay. And this next one is an extremely important one. We have Once Upon a Time in the West uh, from Sergio Leone. I'm not even going to bury the lead here. This is going straight in God tier. This is probably my favorite Western. There aren't too many on this list, but even outside of this list, this is my favorite. I love it so much. The first scene of this movie is literally just some of the best direction and editing and cinematography I've ever seen in my entire life. That first five minutes alone, it's like, okay, this is a five-star movie, done, cut, print. But then you keep going, and Claudia Cardinal is so good in this. Uh, Henry Fonda is doing like a rare villain role, which really suits him, actually, even though it was sort of against type. The movie overall is just so big. It's just so many expansive landscapes and operatic themes, and you'll notice that as a common thread as we go through this list. A lot of my favorite movies are these huge, impossible in scope, uh, ambitious, unwieldy, epic types. That's what I'm drawn to, and this certainly delivers. It's so much about kind of ugly human impulses for survival and greed and revenge and uh, forward progress. So I can't say enough. Uh, go watch this movie if you haven't. And this next one, I believe, is A Man Escaped. I'm not really recognizing this poster, but I'm pretty sure it's A Man Escaped, which is uh, the Brisson movie about a man escaping from prison. It's a very minimal plot, uh, like many of his movies are. I like this movie. I find it meditative, almost in the way that an old point-and-click PC-style game would be, where it's so based in procedure and it's very methodical uh, with all of these insert shots and tools that the character is collecting and little tasks that he's completing. Uh, I just find it almost relaxing in that way. And there's also this spiritual faith sort of element that's uh, grafted on over top. So there's more to it than just a prison escape. Uh, and I find that part really effective as well. So we're going to put this in good overall. Okay, next, it would be nice if I put this next one in flop, right? Because then we'd have like a nice line, but that is not going to happen because this next one is Ugetsu, uh, the Kenji Mizuguchi movie, and I have a lot to say about this one as well. I think in like the Japanese canon, there's sort of a big three of directors being, you know, Kurosawa and then Ozu and then maybe Mizuguchi is like the third, but I feel like he's significantly less well-known to the average person than the other two are, and I think that is a shame because he's probably my favorite out of the three. He's most known for movies about uh, poor people, typically women, living in poverty and the way that they relate to men and the way they try to make their way through the world, and it's always so fascinating. I love basically all of his movies, and this is definitely his best known work, maybe his best. It's about two peasant couples who leave their village in search of economic prosperity and glory, and it does not turn out too well for them. But it's such a great folkloric sort of story. It's just so haunting and tragic and so precisely told. And the ending shot of this movie is just one of my favorite endings ever. It's pretty simple, so if you watch it, you might be like, what? But it's so painterly and thematically poignant, and it really stuck with me and just blew me away the first time I saw it. So this is also going at the very top of our list for sure. This next one is another heavy hitter. I'm realizing that I have to stop saying that every time because it's like, this is the list of the best 100 movies ever made. They're like all heavy hitters. Anyway, um... This next one is Metropolis, which is the very famous uh, 1927, I believe, uh, silent epic from Fritz Lang. 
Very influential, obviously, in the realm of science fiction, also extremely influential in its use of art deco aesthetics. This is just like one of the greatest formal achievements in all of movie history ever. I don't have that much to say about it. I always think about that one scene of the workers at the very beginning, I think, the workers who are walking into the factory and out of the factory and they're in these parallel lines and they're moving in a very robotic way. It's all just so gorgeous and put together so perfectly. I love all of the set design, obviously these matte paintings, the retro futurist sort of vibe, and of course the, again, Art Deco 20s stuff. So the plot is almost ancillary to me, like this is so much about just the aesthetic giant spectacle of it all, but it does also have a lot of interesting notions about uh, humans being, you know, subsumed into technology and us becoming almost more mechanism than person. All that stuff is very prescient, of course. So this is going in love. Now The Gleaners and I is uh, a documentary from Agnes Varda. And it focuses on this phenomenon of uh, people known as gleaners, who you could think of as like scavengers, I guess, who essentially take crops that are left over from harvests. And Varda sort of uses that as an entry point for the movie, but it soon becomes more about the process of art making as a whole and aging as a whole. Of course, she's getting older by this point. And... I like this movie. I think it's very sweet, and there's a sort of melancholy but also playful sense to it. Varda inserts herself into the narrative in a bunch of very fun ways. There's one scene where she's holding a digital camera and then drops it, so you're just watching this footage of a camera dangling and some music over it. It's, you know, very playful, very fun. Varda extrapolates this idea of the gleaner to sort of represent the artistic process as a whole and also our experience on earth as a whole and i think it's very moving actually that said i do sort of bristle at this movie being on this list mostly because i think varda has a lot of better movies that aren't recognized here uh, i'm thinking like vagabond and le bon her are two of my favorite movies ever and i don't know why they're not here and this one is it looks like around like seven years ago Critics just decided, like, this is one of the best movies of the 21st century, and we're going to put it on every list. I think it's good. I don't know if it belongs on this list. I don't think it's the 70th greatest piece of cinematic art ever made, but I do like it. We're going to put it in good. And here we have The Third Man. Um, When I think of this movie, I immediately think of Joseph Cotton and how much I love him, and he makes like any movie he's in instantly better. He, of course, is a frequent collaborator with Orson Welles. Uh, He was a part of that, I believe it was called the Mercury Theater that Orson Welles had, his like theater troupe of actors that he would frequently work with. Anyway, this is a very classic uh, noir sort of movie. It takes place in these bombed out European cities, and I think that's why it's on the list partially. It really captures this post-war vibe with this directionless populace and everything is very dark and dreary. And then we go like full-on expressionist at the end where we have those tunnel scenes where everything is high contrast, black and white, and like Dutch angles. And then you have Orson Welles, who makes a huge impression. Alita Vali has that legendary ending scene. There's just a lot to really like here. I'm going to put it in good just because it doesn't emotionally really grab me, but this is very solid. I like it a lot. Okay, so Goodfellas. I don't have anything novel to say about this. I honestly should just be able to sit here and be like, Ray Liotta, Lorraine Bracco, Joe Pesci, Debbie Mazar for like four seconds, and you should just be nodding like, yes, exactly, I get what you mean. This is obviously just so fun, so frenetic and exciting, and one of Scorsese's best, and I don't have to say anything more than that. And then we get to, this is Casablanca. I like this poster. It's very, it's giving very Tamara de Lempica. It's giving very, like, F. Scott Fitzgerald book cover or something. I've never seen this poster. I like it a lot. But Casablanca, this is the first Best Picture winner also on this list that we're seeing. I think there are three overall. And Casablanca, to me, when I think of studio system movies that aren't based on spectacle and aren't highly stylized or genre-based, just movies where 
the actors and the script are like the main draw. I think that Casablanca is literally the best movie ever made in that realm. Maybe All About Eve is a tie, uh, which All About Eve isn't on this list, which is disgraceful. But anyway, Casablanca is pretty much top tier when it comes to that sort of movie. This is going right in God tier. Humphrey Bogart and Ingrid Bergman are iconic. It's just perfect, 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 compelling, perfect Hollywood magic, gorgeously told story. And speaking of Best Picture winners, we have another one right here, uh, Parasite. So this is one of the most recent movies to be on the list from 2019. And I'm going to come out and say up front that I do not love the inclusion of movies that are that new. I just think that a movie needs some time to breathe before you decide that it's one of the best 100 things ever made, and I don't think Parasite is one of the best 100 things ever made. But anyway, I get that recency bias is a thing. Uh, For Parasite, I would call the first half like one of the best genre movies of the past 20 years or so. I really love it. I think it kind of loses the reins towards the end a bit. I think this movie hit at the right time where it's a foreign movie that people found artistic, but it's also extremely accessible because it's basically a suspense thriller. So I get the appeal. Just a lot of the commentary that the movie's making about capitalism and all this just feel so college class to me. It probably doesn't help that I was in college when it came out. It just reads to me like a movie that a bunch of 20 year olds would come up with who think they have the world all figured out. I don't know, sorry. So it's a really good movie overall for sure, but in terms of its position on this list, I'm going to put it here because I don't think it should be on this list. And this next one is The Earrings of Madame Day uh, from Max Ophels. This is where, okay, the the 1950s French melodrama community is going to eat me up for this one, but this movie just did nothing for me, which I don't know why, because A lot of people that I really respect think that it's such a great movie, but it just didn't grab me in any way. The movie is about a woman and her husband, and also the woman's lover on the side, and the earrings in the title serve as this common motif, which they get passed around and sold and bought, and they sort of become this vector for character motivation and theme, which I think that's really interesting, but it just left me completely cold. I'm going to have to put this in flop, which I feel really bad about, because I'm sure if I rewatched it, I'd probably like it a little more, but I'm not there yet. People who really love this movie, please tell me why, because I I honestly do, like, want to be enlightened. Oh my god, okay, next is La Dolce Vita from Fellini, who actually isn't as featured on this list as you might think. Like, La Strada is in here, which is insane to me, but La Dolce Vita is one of the definitive European mid-century art movies that gives the genre its very glamorous reputation. I am obsessed with this movie. It's gorgeous and indulgent and, like, full of life, but at the same time, it's deconstructing all of that and picking apart all of these very alluring things like romance and wealth and celebrity and showing how hollow they ultimately are. The performances I could just list off, like Anita Ekberg, you have Anouk Amey, you have Nico, who Nico just completely blew me away the first time I saw this. I was just so mesmerized by her in that really extravagant party scene. Notice that I'm like only listing the women, of course, but like those are the stars of the show here, let's be real. Uh, This is, again, one of my favorite movies ever. It's going straight up top. We have a lot in the top tier right now. I promise it'll sort of even out, but we're starting out very strong. This next one is Daughters of the Dust, which is probably one of the the lesser known movies on this list. It's about a family who lives on an island off of, I believe it's Georgia, and their ancestors were slaves, but once slavery was abolished, they just stayed on the island and developed their own pretty isolated culture. And the movie is essentially about them preparing to move to the mainland and join real society. For some context, this is, I believe, the first movie directed by a black woman to get, like, a wide conventional release. So it's sort of on this list for historical purposes, I think. I think there are a lot of interesting elements here. There is this repetitive motif of the beach where so much of this movie takes place, and it brings home these ideas of 
cultural transience and displacement with, you know, this tide that keeps going in and out. My main issue here is the movie's score is so terrible. It honestly ruins the entire movie. It's this saccharine Disney type score over this movie, which is essentially an art movie, and with no score, it would be significantly better. So I'm gonna have to put this in meh, and it's honestly, it would be higher if not for the score. It's like unforgivable for me to place it higher. There is no planet on which this is the 62nd best movie ever made, but I get what it's going for, and I think there's some interesting stuff there. And here we have Sans Soleil, which is a very experimental movie from Chris Marker. So it's very hard to explain this. Technically, it's like a documentary. It's all about human memory and collective unconscious, all these very up-in-the-air ideas. Honestly, it doesn't feel like a movie. It's more like something that you'd see in an art museum. But that said, I did like it. It's mostly like travelogue footage of cities, and they also splice in other movies. I think its best moments are when it gets into these ideas about emerging digital technology. This is like the early 80s is when this came out. And about how that technology is beginning to sort of warp the concept of a memory because once something is held within a digital image or a digital recording, how does that affect the way that we perceive it as a memory? I think that's all really interesting, and I'm not articulating it well enough. You have to watch the movie to see, but I'm going to put this in good. This is the sort of snobbish, sort of pretentious stuff that I think should be on this list. If it's not going to be here, where else is it going to be? And here we have our second Godard movie. This is Contempt. I really love this movie, uh, you know, never have marital problems looked so chic. This is really the sort of thing that I'm usually into. It's alienating and sort of austere, but it's also very emotional at the same time. Bardot is legendary, and the image I'm always thinking of with this movie is towards the end when they're at that gorgeous oceanfront villa, and you get these shots of the ocean and just this blue empty expanse. and. I don't even know what he's trying to say, but I feel something when I see it. It's so great. Um, Godard is batting a thousand so far. Is that the correct term? He's. I love all of his movies so far. Here's another one where I feel like I'm going to get death threats. Um, Blade Runner. I do not like this movie. I know that it's aesthetically very important, and I can appreciate it on that level, I suppose, but... I don't know why it's here. If we're going to put any sort of sci-fi movie on this list, particularly from Ridley Scott, it's like, why is an alien here? Alien's so much better. But I know that's going to piss a lot of people off. Honestly, tell me why you like the movie beyond just like it looks cool, because I'd love to know. I know there's like stuff about what it means to be human, etc., but it just doesn't hit for me. Notice how I like quietly put it in the bottom tier without vocalizing it, hoping that <laughs> maybe people wouldn't notice. Anyway, moving on. So next we have another Buster Keaton movie, Sherlock Jr. This is another movie that I do not like very much. Whenever, when I'm looking through this list, I am always trying to figure out, like, what's the angle? Like, what are critics seeing in this movie that makes them think it's one of the 100 best things ever made, or one of the 10 best things ever made, because they only get 10 votes? I think where they're coming from with this one is that part of the premise involves uh, Buster Keaton dreaming that he's entering a movie, so there's sort of some interesting thematic stuff going on there. I think that there are some good stunts in the movie as usual, but again, it just doesn't connect with me at all. I don't want to seem like I hate silent comedies because I feel like that's what it's looking like, but I love silent comedies. I just don't really love the ones that they chose for this list. Honestly, if you really want to get into it, if you really want to get real, the person who I really love is Harold Lloyd. He's sort of like always a bridesmaid when you're comparing him to Buster Keaton and Charlie Chaplin, but I like his movies the best out of the three. I think his visual gags are the most clever. I think he's the funniest. But this one, again, I, I don't really like this one, so sorry, bottom tier. And then here's another one of those very film schooly type movies, Battleship Potemkin from Sergei Eisenstein. The sort of Wikipedia rundown of this movie is that it's famous for pioneering the style of montage editing. There's a very famous sequence, I think the Odessa Step sequence is what it's called. Uh, in which these quick cross-cuts are used. 
it's fun to watch this editing style be experimented with and sort of birthed in front of you. The movie definitely feels very propulsive, especially compared to other movies of the time. There is another movie on this list that's in this similar Soviet experimental vein that I think is exponentially better, so we'll hold on that. But this one we're going to put in good. I like it, and I guess more importantly, I respect it. I know this is the type of movie some people get annoyed at on these lists because it's a grandfathered in old stale thing, but I don't agree with that at all. This is exactly where we should be acknowledging a movie like this. It's a building block of the medium, and without honoring it here, you totally lose perspective and these things just get lost to history. And here we have another recent Best Picture winner, uh, Moonlight. So this is another one where, again, you know how I feel about these new movies being put on this list. I can see why a bunch of critics are like name checking it, but I don't think enough time has passed to call this the 61st best movie ever made. The movie has a nice lyrical feel to it. I really love the score. It's stylistically very unique. It's just not one of my favorite movies of that decade, let alone of all time. I don't know, if you want me to be honest, I think that the latter half of the 2010s is pretty much a dead zone when it comes to genuinely interesting, challenging, artistic movies, so it troubles me that four of the 100 movies on this list come from that very specific period. So we're gonna put this in meh. Again, I don't hate the movie or anything, I just don't love the recency bias, and I don't know, it doesn't do too much for me. And here we have another Best Picture winner. This is, I think, the fourth that we've seen, and I think this is the last one that we'll see. Uh, this is The Apartment from Billy Wilder. So this is like a fan favorite movie. It's one of the more standard commercial studio pictures to be on this list. I do enjoy The Apartment. I don't think I like it as much as everybody else does. I think it's cute. I think there are definitely some good performances in it, and it does feel certainly prescient in terms of its critique of corporate America and how dehumanizing it is. But I don't know, it's never been like one of my favorite movies or anything. It's not one of my favorite Best Picture winners, and it's not one of my favorites on this list either. So this one I'm going to put in meh. People aren't gonna like that. We're, we're doing a lot of hot takes in a row, aren't we? But here, now this is a movie that I love. So this is uh, another hard poster to discern, but this is Chungking Express from Wong Kar Wai. This is one of those movies that I first watched it when I was probably too young to watch it and didn't really understand it, and I found it so aimless and boring, but then I rewatched it and it all clicked, and I think it's one of the great movies of the 90s. It's stunning and emotional. Everyone in this movie is like beautiful and striking. The plot of this is sort of hard to explain in a pithy way, but it takes place in this market area of Hong Kong and deals with missed connections and romance and loneliness among like four or so characters. I think my favorite part of the movie is it's constantly playing with this idea of like public and private space. The movie is sort of split up into two different stories and in both of them there are these set pieces of like this manufactured false fleeting intimacy. Like there's a hotel room in one of the sequences and then in the other there's a person's apartment that another person breaks into. It's like a long story but anyway there's this sense of like false domesticity and intimacy that I think is really touching and gorgeous and it's hard to explain if you can't tell. There's also just so much imagery here that communicates those similar ideas like uh, expiration dates on cans is like a big motif, and a boarding pass that's written on a napkin. There's just so much going on, and like if I wrote something out I could probably be a lot more articulate about it, but I love this movie. I think, I think I'm gonna put it in love. I'm trying to be really judicious about like what goes in God tier, but we'll see. I might move it up later. I'm, I'm on the fence about this one, but for now we're doing love. And this movie in particular makes me anxious about the list as a whole because if I did this list after my first watch of the movie, it would literally be like at the bottom, and now it's near the top. So it makes me think all these movies that I'm putting at the bottom that I've only seen once, you know, maybe my opinion would change if I watched them a second time, but you know, what am I gonna do? Such is life, this will live on forever, and I just have to deal with that. 
Oh god, okay, this is another one I have a lot to say about. This is Ali Fear Eats the Soul, the only entry on this list from director Reiner Werner Fassbinder, who is probably my personal favorite director of all time. And that's going to make my placement of this movie pretty surprising, because this is the one anointed movie he always gets on these types of polls. It's like his designated spot in the pantheon. And for those who don't know, it's a spiritual remake of All That Heaven Allows from Douglas Sirk, who Fassbender was obsessed with. So it's a classic star-crossed romance, people are prejudiced so we can't be together sort of thing. And everyone loves it, but to me it's his least interesting. I have literally over 10 movies from him I'd put on this list, but this is not one of them. Fassbinder was a very young German iconoclastic, chaotic genius. He was insanely prolific through the 70s, and his movies were very perverse and visually distinct. He uses color in a very specific way. He has an unmistakable blocking style since his roots were in theater, and at its core, all of his work was looking at sexuality and gender dynamics in ways that are far more transgressive than anything coming out today. And this movie does have some of those elements. It's still aesthetically precise, but it feels a little stale to me compared to something like Fox and His Friends, or The Marriage of Maria Braun, or Carell, or The Bitter Tears of Petra von Kant, or Berlin Alexanderplatz. So it's just not that exciting to me that he's remembered for this one, when if you look even one inch below the surface, you'll find stuff that's so much more unique. But that's my own issue, we can move on. For the list, I'm gonna put this in meh, unfortunately, which pains me because just know Fassbinder as a man, as a director, is like in the highest god tier possible, but I'm judging the movie that's actually in front of me, and I think it's just fine. Moving on to news from home. So this is the first appearance of Chantal Ackerman on this list. We'll definitely get to her later, because if you know anything about this list, you know she's a big topic of conversation. So this is a very experimental documentary about Chantal moving to New York. So it's essentially footage of the city with voiceover of Chantal reading letters that her mother wrote to her. It's a simple concept, but it's pretty haunting, and it portrays this urban loneliness with such clarity, and you really feel it. The ending shot of the movie, I mean, spoiler alert for the 70s avant-garde documentary news from home, but the ending shot shows the view of New York as the camera is on a ferry that's boating away from the city, and I can't really go into why it's so breathtaking without getting into the context, but it's pretty breathtaking. This is another one of those, like, Sans Soleil, which feels less like a movie than an art piece, uh, but again, I really like it. So we're going to put this in good. It's like a high good, but we're going to keep it in good. Okay, next we have The Piano from Jane Campion. So this is an interesting one where I rewatched it pretty recently, and in some ways it's better than I remembered, but then in some ways it's kind of worse than I remembered. So the story is about this mute woman and her daughter in New Zealand who gets married off to this like enterprising new husband, and they settle down in this really foggy, kind of foresty area. And then there's like a bit of a love triangle situation, but you know, I'm not going to go into it. This is a legendary Oscar-winning performance from Holly Hunter, who's a fantastic actress. This is probably one of the few movies on the list that features an Oscar-winning performance in it. Uh, like, I'm seeing Goodfellas also does, and Moonlight also does, and maybe that's it? Maybe I'm missing some. I don't know. The best parts of this movie are the imagistic elements that Jane Campion is so great at. The whole thing feels sensory, and so much of the movie is wordless and about silence, and it's very effective. But on this recent rewatch, I feel like you also start to notice more the elements that are kind of schmaltzy and definitely feel a little bit 90s Miramaxy, and I wasn't loving that. I think that The Power of the Dog is the stronger Campion movie. I wouldn't put it on this list yet just because it came out so recently, but I think that that would have more of an argument to be higher up on this list. So we're going to put this in good. I'm kind of sitting on the fence a little bit because there are elements that I think are fantastic and then elements that I think sort of weigh it down a little bit. 
Next up, you might not be able to tell from the poster, but this is The 400 Blows uh, from Truffaut, another French New Wave classic. Um, this is one of those where it's such an enormous movie that it's like, what am I going to tell you about The 400 Blows that you haven't heard before? We're going to put it in good. I think there's just some new wave stuff that appeals to me a little more, but I think it's definitely a really beautifully told story. The ending is iconic and really sticks with you. I mean, you know, being a parent is hard and being a kid is confusing. And I think the movie is sitting with that relationship without prodding at it in a way that feels contrived. And I think that a lot of people that imitate this movie aren't able to do it in a way that feels natural. All right, and here we have Ordet, which is uh, directed by Dreyer. Plot-wise, I guess you could just say that this is about three brothers and the different relationships they have with the religion. I think it does an incredible job portraying spirituality as this force that provides some individual sense of clarity and purpose, like a sense of directionality in life. And it's all told in these beautiful, crisp, stark images. It it's, feels kind of similar to Ingmar Bergman in that way. I really love this overall. We're going to put this right up here in love. Then we have Wanda here, which is directed by Barbara Loden. This is another one of those that's here for, I assume, a historical purpose. So this is, I believe, the first movie that's written, directed, and starring the same woman. Loden was married to Aaliyah Kazan, and then she made this one movie in, I believe, 1970, and then never made a movie again. So it's now regarded as this cult indie new Hollywood classic, I guess. It's sort of in that Cassavetes milieu, which is not my thing. It's about this woman who, throughout the movie, she's in this trance state almost, and she leaves her family and gets involved with a criminal. There's some great imagery for sure. It's a movie that makes you feel very detached from society, as is the intention. There's this one great image that always comes to my head of her walking through this giant industrial ash field. Very evocative. Love that. So I know everyone loves this and views it as this unsung feminist masterpiece. I'm not sold on that idea. I think there's other movies that tackle the issue in a more interesting way. We're going to put this in meh. Again, anytime I put something in good or below, I'm like, somebody's going to get mad at this. This is somebody's favorite movie. Then we have Barry Lyndon. Okay, so our first Kubrick movie, first of many. Barry Lyndon is the story of a guy accidentally social climbing his way through the world. It's famously one of the most beautiful movies ever. Every single shot looks like an 18th century painting. I have no hot takes here. I particularly love movies that use a lot of natural light and candlelight. That's just very aesthetically pleasing to me. My standout, which is maybe different from what most people take away from this movie, is Marissa Berenson's performance. Marissa Berenson is one of my great underappreciated legends of this era. Uh, she was a model in the 70s, of course, and she's great in cabaret. She's also the granddaughter of Elsa Scaparelli, which a lot of people don't know. But she gives in this movie what I would call one of the great silent performances that isn't in a silent movie. She does talk at some parts, but for most of the movie, you're looking at her expressive face as she's going through these waves of ennui or love or anguish, and it's just mesmerizing to me. I love her in this movie so much. She's the best part. I'm a little back and forth on this one. I am between like love or good, but I think we're going to put it in good. Uh, we're almost like grading on a Kubrick curve a little bit for this one, because even though it's great, it's kind of mid-tier Kubrick for me. He has other movies that are coming up that I think are more artistically ambitious uh, from a thematic level. So we're going to give those the top tier, and this one will keep in good. All right, here we get to, is this our first Hitchcock? This is our first Hitchcock. Okay, exciting. So North by Northwest is... Hitchcock's biggest, most audacious blockbuster. You could say that this is him at his artistic peak um, in the late 50s. I'm pretty sure the screenwriter wrote this movie with the premise of making the most Hitchcocky Hitchcock movie possible. So it's just the most glamorous and twisty thing ever. It's obviously formally stunning. There's such a big focus on architecture, like even that first shot, which is the cross-cutting grid of 
a skyscraper and then you have the UN building and you have that Frank Lloyd Wright house and you have Mount Rushmore. It's one of those instances where you have such a high level artist working at such an advanced level that you literally like see iconography being created in front of you. And aside from all the great twists and the perfect costumes and the performances and the score, oh my god, you also have this really interesting element where you find out that most of the plot winds up being this CIA bureaucratic MacGuffin, which also heightens the artifice of it all. The only thing that puts this below the top top tier Hitchcock to me is it's lacking some of the voyeuristic perversity that his very best works have to me. So this is going to go in love, but don't worry, Hitchcock is going to be no stranger to the top of this list, so don't be too upset. And next we have Killer of Sheep. So this is another very underground movie that made it onto this list. It's essentially a movie about a black family in LA, and I don't know how to explain it further. It's a bunch of disconnected vignettes that don't really come together, but it's supposed to more paint an impressionistic picture of an experience. It's very detached and naturalistic and definitely feels very late 60s. I just couldn't get a foothold into this world because it's so bare bones. So I don't know, I don't see top 100 for this at all. I certainly don't see number 44. That is completely absurd. But I'm debating between flop and meh. We'll put it in meh because I do like some of the stylistic elements, but otherwise it's not doing too much for me. All right, this next one is The Battle of Algiers. So this is a story about a French slash Algerian colonial rebellion struggle type thing. It's the rare art movie that also is just a genuinely compelling thriller. Most of the movie takes place in this very old, ancient-looking part of the city, and it's a lot about this hegemonic military maneuvering coming up against this guerrilla, rebel human spirit. And that all makes it feel very compelling and very immediate, too. So this is very good, and because of that, it's going to go in good. Look at that. And look at this distribution we have. I mentioned the bell curve at the beginning, and that's like exactly what this is, and I'm not even trying to be that much of a stickler about it, but that's sort of just the way it's shaking out. So now we have Stalker from Tarkovsky, who is another person who's going to show up a couple times on this list. This is kind of a tough one to talk about. It's inscrutable and complex as many Tarkovsky movies are. I don't even know how to describe the plot. It's basically a man guiding a couple other men through a strange zone that houses something they want. You could almost think of it like Annihilation, but instead of Natalie Portman, there are long, artful shots of nothing. And I don't mean that in a disparaging way, of course. Um, the movie is beautiful. It's so beautiful. I love the way that Tarkovsky shoots water. I could just stare at it all day. But this is one of those movies where I'm perfectly fine admitting that I think I just need to be older to allow this to click with me fully. There are moments where I'm watching and I'm like, I think I need to acquire some more existential angst in my life in order to fully understand this. Because right now, for me, it's gorgeous and very deliberate and poetic, but I am having trouble finding what I'm supposed to take from it. Which, obviously, these types of movies don't have to have an answer. That's not what I'm looking for. I just am having trouble finding a thematic entry point, I guess. So this pains me to do. I'm not trying to call Tarkovsky meh or be glib about it. I just, at this point in time in my life, it doesn't resonate with me as much as the movies above it do. But I have a feeling that someday it will. So we're going to put a pin in that. And next we have Rashomon. So this is, I think, our first Kurosawa movie who will also show up one or two more times. I think Rashomon is actually the first serious arty movie I probably ever saw. I watched it in middle school, I think, and I liked it then, and I've watched it a few times since, and I like it more every time. It's such a streamlined, precise movie. It feels like a folklore story that would have been passed down for thousands of years or something like that. If you've seen the movie, you of course know already that it's famous for its narrative structure, which tells the same story from a bunch of different perspectives. So this brings up a lot of 
ideas about objectivity and truth and the human condition. I think for this, I'm between love or good. It's like very high good or low love. We're going to put it in good for now and then see how I feel later. We're just like hitting classic after classic right now. So here we have Bicycle Thieves, which is the very famous Italian neorealist movie. I hate to do this. I feel like we're in like a bit of a negative slump right now, but uh, I don't like Bicycle Thieves that much. It's not my thing. It's about a poor working class guy whose bicycle gets stolen and he spends the movie searching for this bicycle with his young son. I see why it's important on a cinematic level, but I tend to just trend more expressionistic and operatic in the things that I'm drawn to, and this is definitely not that. It's pretty dreary, so does this go in flop? I'm not going to put Bicycle Thieves in flop. We'll put it in meh. We'll put it in meh. All right, moving on. This next one is Tuki Buki. I would categorize this as a vibe movie. It's very cool and stylish. Uh, it takes place in Africa and was made in Africa. It definitely feels French New Wavy, so I imagine it was certainly inspired by that in some way. It's about two friends uh, trying to leave Senegal to go to Paris. It's very stylish. There are some interesting formal elements. Like, if you watch the movie, you'll know there's this soundtrack repetition that they keep doing over and over and over again, and it becomes this auditory motif. And it's kind of grating, but also thematically significant. I honestly think this gets a lot of points based on cool factor alone. It's almost like breathless in that way. So we're going to put this in good overall. Then we move on to another Kubrick, The Shining. This is probably one of the more widely seen movies on the list. This is another one of those movies where it's like, what am I going to add to the discussion that's novel? This is like the most discussed movie of all time. I will say when I last rewatched this, the thing that stood out most to me is just how idiosyncratic Jack Nicholson and Shelley Duvall are and how we have no replacements for them whatsoever in the culture. They're such singular figures and they're both so perfect here. And just the colors in this movie, the reds and the blues and the fluorescent beiges, this is definitely going to go in love. It's also one of the few movies that feels genuinely evil not even externally, but there's just this internal, sinister, ticking clock to it all. Uh, I liken it to Texas Chainsaw in that way, but I guess that doesn't have the, the high art sheen, so it doesn't get to be on this list. Although, for the record, it definitely should be. Anyway, next we have, what is this, our second Hitchcock entry. This is Rear Window. This is going, it's been a minute since we've had a god tier, but this is going straight up in god tier. It's one of the best distillations of all of Hitchcock's weird interests and strengths. We all know that Hitchcock is very interested in uh, voyeurism and impotence and all these things, and he uses that fascination to turn the outside world via this courtyard outside of the apartment window into this collection of fetishistic sexual funhouse mirrors or shadow boxes or something. It's so brilliant. And even aside from the thematic elements, it's one of the most intricate movies ever. Like, the production design is crazy. Grace Kelly is at her beauty peak. Uh, that dress she's wearing from Edith Head is like, oh my god. And even beyond that, like, on an instinctual level, it's just one of the tensest movies ever. I always think of that scene where Jimmy Stewart is looking into the apartment across the way with binoculars at the guy, and the guy suddenly looks up and he's looking directly into the binoculars into the camera at you and you just freeze up like you feel like you're a rabbit who just got caught and is about to be killed or something like you feel like a prey animal it's crazy so i could go on and on about this but it's just like pretty much a perfect movie so we're following up rear window with some like it hot from billy wilder i mean this is just a fantastic comedy jack lemon is stellar tony curtis too Marilyn is maybe at her most memorable here. She's breathy and like woozy. And of course, like on the back end of that, it's because the production was a nightmare and Marilyn was not in a great state and could hardly remember her lines and all this, which you can sort of tell, but she's still like a 10,000 megawatt star. So 
it doesn't matter. It also has one of the best closing gags ever in a movie. The whole thing feels very modern, very ahead of its time. I do think it's a little crazy to say that it's the 39th best achievement in the entire medium, but we're going to put it in good overall. It's very interesting to me. Billy Wilder comes up on this list three times, and of course he is a fantastic director and writer, it is a little weird that out of all the classic Hollywood pictures, he gets three and like William Wyler gets none, George Cukor gets none, Capra, Kazan, Mankiewicz, uh, Howard Hawks, neither of Victor Fleming's two big movies are here, which is a joke. I will say that out of the three they chose, Some Like It Hot feels the most well-deserved to me, but what do you think makes him such a favorite? Like, I guess his writing feels very contemporary, so maybe that's it, but I don't know. Something to chew on. Then we're going back a couple decades now to M from Fritz Lang. This is our second Fritz Lang movie on the list, and this one is about a serial killer. This movie is extremely well-directed, and there's a great Peter Lorre performance as well. I do think it's probably due for a rewatch on my end, because I see it right now as a very thrilling, well-told story, but I'm wondering if there's something greater that's beneath the surface that I didn't catch on my first watch, because I watched this, you know, for the first time years ago, and I feel like there might be something that I'm missing that could take it over the edge into something really great. Until then, we're going to keep it in good, because even just on a genre movie level, it's so well done. Okay, this next one is interesting. So this is The Spirit of the Beehive. To give a vague plot, it's about a girl who's living after the Spanish Civil War, and you basically view a series of vignettes about her childhood. The movie Frankenstein, like the classic movie Frankenstein, is also a recurring motif because she sees the movie at one point and then it becomes a figment of her imagination. I would say that it's a very good movie overall. The thing that stands out the most to me, though, is how much it feels like a del Toro movie. Like, it is shocking. And of course, this movie came out before del Toro started his career, so this movie did it first, and Guillermo del Toro is very open about this being a major influence on his life, so I'm not, like, blowing the lid off of anything here, but you're watching it, and you're like, man, you said you were inspired by this movie, and you are not lying. Like, this literally, it feels like Pan's Labyrinth. But anyway, that was just a tangent. We're gonna put this movie in good. I find it pretty interesting. Next, we're going back to the silent era. So this is our first Chaplin. This is City Lights. City Lights, I think, is my favorite work of Chaplin's. I am, again, going to sound like a silent comedy hater, and I'm not. I just don't always connect with Chaplin. I think his movies can feel a little too schmaltzy for me in a way that I find annoying rather than endearing. But This one is where the romance actually feels authentic, and there's this sweeping sense to it that is really beautiful. We're going to put this in good. There are also a lot of great little set pieces in here. It's sort of the quintessential silent dramedy, right? I hate that we're not going to have a silent comedy that's like in the top tiers, but if you had thrown me like a safety last or a speedy, then we'd be talking. But I do like City Lights a lot, so we're going to keep it in good. Oh my god, okay, so this is Pather Panchali. This is one of my favorite movies ever. This movie is devastating. It's so quiet, and it really sneaks up on you on an emotional level. The movie is actually part of a trilogy, but this one is about a young boy and his family as they're growing up in rural abject poverty, and his parents are having this interpersonal marital strife, and there's just so much stunning visual poetry. Like, it'll be a scene of a lake with little water bugs making ripples on the surface, and it's like the most evocative, gorgeous, emotional thing you've ever seen in your entire life. And although the movie is centered on this boy, in many ways it's really about the mother and the ways that she is trying to find a sense of dignity or peace in a very hard, unforgiving life. And because this is always brought up as one of the greats and it's very film schooly in that way, I think it can feel a little bit 
intimidating or the type of thing that you just have to check off your list and it's very dour and serious. But if you haven't watched this, please watch this movie like right now. It's extremely accessible, even though it is very artistic. It's just beautiful. So this is going straight up in God tier. I love it. Oh, and now we have the leopard. Oh my God. This is like combo double kill, like two perfect movies in a row. This is going right up in God tier. The Leopard is one of my favorite movies ever. This is directed by Visconti. I think of it as the Italian Gone with the Wind, not really in plot, but abstractly, thematically, I feel like they're speaking to similar things. So essentially in, I think the 1800s, Italy is going through all of this political upheaval and it's like unifying itself into a single country. And this movie follows an aristocratic family with Burt Lancaster as the patriarch as they watch the world that they knew die and this new world come into being. And this is one of the most visually stunning movies ever. So much of it takes place in these giant opulent villas and estates and there are giant ballroom scenes that will just take your breath away. I already mentioned Burt Lancaster, who gives a fantastic performance. Claudia Cardinal is amazing. Elaine Delon is in this as well. And by the way, this is number 93 on the list, which is absurd when you look at some of the stuff that's above it. I don't know. This is just one of those movies that keeps getting pushed down over the years by less good movies, and it is very irritating. And speaking of less good movies, we have La Talant. This is another one that I honestly should probably give a rewatch to because I didn't connect with it on first viewing at all. It's about a couple who come to live on a boat where all these men are working and then they have marital issues. I, it left very little impression on me. I do like the moodiness and there's some imagery involving the boat that I remember being pretty striking, but I don't know, if you really like this movie, let me know why because I didn't take much from it. I am really being a Philistine here because this is high up on the list and it's been on the list for like decades and decades and decades, but I'm putting this in flop. I don't care. It did nothing for me. And now we have the fantastic La Ventura. I feel like a broken record saying this is one of my favorite movies of all time, but this is actually genuinely probably top 10 favorite movies. Antonioni is a very important director to me. This is one of those movies that back in the day, decades ago, it reached, I believe, number two on this list. It used to be one of the movies. Since then, it's obviously still very well respected, but decade after decade, it goes a little bit lower, a little bit lower every year. And currently, I think it's hanging out around the 70s, slumming it, which I hate because it should be easily in the top 20, in my top 10 probably. And Antonioni as a whole is not well represented on this list the way he should be. I think that he shows up a few times in the top 200, but this is his only one in the top 100, which is totally ridiculous. He's one of the most significant European directors ever. The story here is about two lovers and their friend, and then one of the girls disappears and the rest of the movie is spent looking for her. And that sounds very vague and abstract, and it is. It's very slow. It's, some would say, the B word, boring. I would never say that. What you're really coming here for is the mood of it all. You have these detached performances and the most perfect shot composition literally ever. You have so many perfect shots here of buildings and architecture and nature just imposing, blown up on the screen, giant wide shots, and then our little characters dwarfed somewhere on the side. And then you have Monica Vitti, which uh, let me tell you something about Monica Vitti. I love Monica Vitti, and this is one of her great performances. She's just one of the most fascinating faces to stare at for two hours. I mean, all this is to say that this is one of those movies where you either get it or you don't. It's either going to be a parody of an art movie to you, or it's going to be one of the most cosmically stirring experiences of your entire life. And I hope for your sake that you're in the latter camp. I definitely am. Needless to say, this is one of the easiest God tiers that I've handed out so far. And next we have Get Out from Jordan Peele, another one of these new movies. 
I feel like I'm repeating myself with these, so let me go on my big rant now because I have to at some point. I mean, I guess to start out before I go off for like five minutes, Get Out is fine. I think it's an effective thriller. I think it's funny. There are a bunch of great performances. Lil Rel Howery, Allison Williams is everything to me, Catherine Keener, Betty Gabriel. But voting for these recent cultural phenomenon movies bothers me because this list is supposed to represent a canon of sorts, right? And this great big story of art. And really, a canon is decided by what movies are still influencing the art form decades down the line. And you can't tell what movies have stood the test of time until you've gone through the time. Things like Get Out and Parasite speak to now. They are very 2010s, exhaustingly so. But what the consensus thinks is the most important in the moment might not actually be correct. Like, in the 40s, people were probably saying that Mrs. Miniver was the best movie ever, right? Because it's speaking to World War II and capturing the national mood. And like, in the late 60s, for example, you'd probably say, like, Easy Rider, right? Easy Rider is the best movie ever. This movie gets the current moment. And are Mrs. Miniver or Easy Rider on the sight and sound list? No, nowhere close. So that's why I don't think that these super new movies should even be in contention, really. But what I really don't like, even beyond that, is if we're going to pick new movies, the ones that were picked feel like the most basic, run-of-the-mill 2010s options. It's like, are we on film Twitter? These choices are basically what any like letterboxed user who vaguely keeps up with prestige movies would say are the best of the decade. And I think the voting pool for this list should be operating at a higher level than that. And I know that sounds snobbish, but this is the one list where we're allowed to, and I think should be, some degree of snobbish. If you're going to put some really new movies on here, at least be a tastemaker. Like, take a swing, be bold. You're handing over these new additions, which, let's be real, look like a lot of thinly veiled political posturing based on what you think is most morally righteous to highlight, and I'm not even some expert of the past decade, but can't we find anything more formally complex or challenging or metaphysical or philosophically puzzling? Like, where is Under the Skin? Where's anything from Lynn Ramsey, maybe? You know, You Were Never Really Here, Morvern Caller, Andrea Arnold, where's Twin Peaks The Return? Where's Caché? Where's Hanukkah, Gaspar Noé, Von Trier, Breaking the Waves, or Dancer in the Dark, Harmony Kareen, are you kidding? One of the only visionaries of the past 30 years. Old Boy, Grizzly Man, even something like The Blair Witch Project, and I'll argue that for real. I know I'm just listing off movies I personally like at this point, but what I'm looking for is actual art. Is that so much to ask for? something more ambitious and bold than these teacher's pet picks that have already been chewed up and video essayed and applauded by every single person with a liberal arts degree. <sighs> I know that was a big rant, but it's just lame to me. It's really lame. It's so clear that the tail is wagging the dog these days with critics and so many absorb all of their opinions from the most standard, online, media class consensus, rather than explicating their own personal taste. And it's boring. Okay, I really needed to get that out, and now we can move forward. And we're not even specifically talking about Get Out at this point. That was just me complaining about everything having to do with the movie world right now. So I guess I'm going to put this in flop. Um, I don't know, come, you know, talk to me in 30 years and, and we can reevaluate. I think I have to play around a bit with these bottom tier movies and see where exactly I want them to go, because some of them I might have to switch around. Like, as I'm adding more movies, I'm starting to get compulsive about, like, this movie is above that movie, but that movie's below that movie, and I don't know, at the end we'll do, like, a great reorganization just to make sure everything is looking right to me. Continuing on, we have... Uh, Psycho from Hitchcock. This is going straight in God tier. I don't want to waste anyone's time. 
This is just one of the best thrillers ever made. I can't even imagine what it must have been like to see this in a theater in, what, 1960? It must have been the most jarring cool thing ever. As much as people talk about Anthony Perkins' performance, it's still not enough. He's so perfectly cast here, and it has to be one of the most neurotic, bizarre, psychosexually tormented characterizations of a villain ever. I'm very basic when it comes to Hitchcock. I have nothing contrarian to bring to the table here, except that The Bird should also be on this list and probably pretty high up. Okay, and this is the part where all the esoteric bitches in the back are like clapping and cheering because this is Satan Tango. I love this movie just because it has such an absurd reputation. I feel like when you first get into movies, when you're like 15, you vaguely know of this really long, scary, intimidating, eight-hour Hungarian black and white slow art movie. And that's exactly what this is, and I love every second of it. The very broad sketch of the plot here is that we're following a bunch of villagers who are in this collapsed communist state, and you go through a bunch of little vignettes, but you're really here to soak in the ambiance and the dread. This is great. This is exactly what I'm here for. I love a movie that chains you to the radiator and forces you to stare at it for many hours and contend with all of the extremity that life has to offer. And this sort of thing seems indulgent, and it definitely is to some extent, but there's a real point to it, and you fall into this hypnotized rhythm where you're watching these 10-minute clips of people dancing, or a cow grazing in a field, or someone cleaning up a mess, and it puts you in this mindset where you're seeing the world as it is, and watching actions have consequences, and following through with the consequences in real time. If you want a movie that has something articulate to say about the modern condition, watch Belatar movies. This was made in the 90s, and it has far more to say about the 2020s than anything that has come out in the 2020s. Overall, this is definitely going in love. I love it as a work of art, and also for the challenge it represents. You have to watch this movie all in one sitting, by the way. If you break it up at all, you're totally cheating, and you're not doing it right. And here we have, I think, the last Fellini movie on this list, Eight and a Half, his semi-autobiographical, surreal examination of the creative process. I will say this movie is a lot to wrap your head around in one viewing, and I've only seen it once, so I'd be curious on rewatch. I imagine that I would grow in appreciation for it. I do like it a lot already. I always think back to that recurring image of the giant rocket launch pad framework girder thing. I don't even know what it is, but I think it's such a perfect, imposing piece of imagery that comes to represent this artistic potentiality or something. Although I think I might have mentioned earlier, I would put La Strada on this list even before Eight and a Half. La Strada would rank very highly to me. Even Knights of Kiberia, I mean, he has a lot of great ones. We're gonna put this in good. I like it a lot. It certainly isn't as influential on me personally as La Dolce Vita was, but again, I feel like I have to watch it a second time for it to really sink in. Then we're gonna round out the crop of the very modern entries with Portrait of a Lady on Fire. This is directed by uh, Celine Siama. Now, I want you all to open up your textbooks to the 2022 Sight and Sound poll top 100 and take a real close look and see that this movie is ranked at number 30. So this tells us that this movie is better than the collective ooves of Visconti, Antonioni, Fassbinder, Agnes Varda, Fritz Lang, Sergio Leone, Tarkovsky, Mizaguchi. This is, of course, insanity. And I'm not even trying to be obnoxious because I like the movie. I remember enjoying it in 2019. I remember it being very well shot and the ending has stuck with me. But Stop lying to me. No one thinks this is the 30th best movie ever made. It's not even the best lesbian movie of that decade. 
at least all the other modern astroturfed entries on this list have the decency to stay down in like the 80s or 90s, but this one popping up to number 30, almost in the 20s, that is just crazy to me. And it came out three years ago. So on principle, this one is going straight and flop, not even as a movie on its own, but in the context of it being a representative within the Sight and Sound poll 2022 top 100. And next up, before anyone accuses me of being pretentious and only liking movies when they're old or done by important auteurs, we have this very hoity-toity cinephile's dream five and a half hour documentary of Godard giving his musings on movies, and I hate it. I think I have a high threshold for cerebral type stuff, but this is beyond the pale for me. But the real thing that makes this movie pretty impossible for me to digest is the fact that it's in French, obviously, so Godard is talking and his speech is subtitled, but then Godard will also put text on the screen, which is also in French, and it's also subtitled separately from the subtitled speech. And then there are images on the screen from movies that I may or may not recognize, probably don't recognize. It is literally incomprehensible to me, and it's interminable, but I see a lot of knowledgeable, knowledgeable people who are obsessed with it, so more power to them. I wish that I could get it, but I don't. So this is going in flop, almost by default. This is like the one movie on the list that I feel like Borderline gets an incomplete, like it almost should exist outside of this chart because it's not a movie that I hate or dislike because I don't like what it's saying. It's because I literally cannot decipher what it's saying. But for the record, this is going at the very bottom of the tier. I know I haven't really ordered things, but just know this is the very bottom of the bottom of the list. Now, if you've made it this far into the video, you finally get to watch me praise a recent movie, because Tropical Malady from Weir Setha Cool, the Thai indie filmmaker, is one of my favorite movies on this entire list, and it came out in 2004. I knew absolutely nothing about this movie going in, and then it blew me away. It's definitely the best gay movie on the list, it's one of the best I've ever seen, and it's one of the only ones that really gets the sense of alienation and bizarre, frightening, self-destructive, abject terror and frenzy of it all. There are so few genuinely great gay movies. I'm thinking like The Boys in the Band, Myra Breckenridge, Suddenly Last Summer, even things that are more subliminal, like Rebel Without a Cause, and those movies don't always align with popular critical consensus. So when all of these critics put this on the list, I'm pleasantly surprised, but I'm almost like, do some of you even really know what you're looking at here? Like, I feel like you're stumbling into an extremely correct decision, but by all means, please continue. Without spoiling it, because you definitely don't want this spoiled, it's about two men in Thailand who meet and they develop a tacit romantic friendship and then the movie takes a turn and abstracts itself out into this philosophical dreamscape. It's slow, it's intriguing, it's psychologically terrorizing to me. This movie really gets it and I'm so glad that it being on this list gave me an excuse to watch it because I've known of it peripherally for years and years and years, but didn't realize it was this good. So if it wasn't already clear, this is going in the very top tier. And speaking of great 21st century movies, this is another case where we have two classics right in a row. This is Yi Yi from Edward Yang, and this is going right up next to Tropical Malady. I would call this one of the very few new millennium masterpieces that truly feels like it belongs on a list like this. It's way down at 91, and it should be higher. It should definitely be above any of those 2010s movies that we already went through. It's a long movie about a nuclear family living in Taipei, and we follow them all individually as they go about their very atomized private lives. Yang creates a really rich world here, and it 
only helps that he's working in such a beautiful and modern city. There are times when he'll shoot the interior of this family's apartment from the outside. So you're looking through the window, through these distorted reflections and bits of the skyline and the reflecting lights, and it's really beautiful. So much of what I take from it is about the banality of life and the way the world just moves forward and hums along as you're changing and trying so hard to keep up with it. It's a towering piece of work, and I think it speaks to the current moment, even though it's 20 years old, more than almost any movie does today. I think you could compare it to Antonioni and the way his movies had this stark look to them, and they were speaking to this mid-century post-war mood, and in the same way, this movie is speaking to the Y2K incoming internet age mood. And it feels foreboding in that way. I don't think there are too many movies made during that very specific era where we were on the precipice of the world changing into what it is today. I don't think there are too many movies that speak to that in a truly sophisticated way, and this is one of them. This next one is Mirror, again from Tarkovsky, I wish these Tarkovsky movies came in a different order on this site because we have to talk about the two that I don't like as much first, and it looks like I don't like him, but I really do. It's the only movie of his I've seen where I'm really at a loss completely and just passively absorbing it all. I can't say I took anything profound from it, but even when I'm totally floating off in outer space and don't even have a bit of a tether to what's actually going on, I'll always like his movies because they're so hypnotic and immersive. His movies could easily be called boring, but I'm never bored with them. I'm always enjoying watching it even when I don't feel I'm getting as much as I should be out of it. So this is another one that I'll definitely re-watch a few times throughout my life, and I'm sure that every time I watch I'll get something more from it and eventually love it, but right now I can't pin it down well enough to say that it's truly one of my favorite movies or anything like that, so we're going to put this in meh. These last three movies that I've put in meh make me look so terrible. Let's keep this between us. Then what is this next one? I. It looks like Blade Runner. Oh no, okay, this is Taxi Driver. It looks like Blade Runner though. So Taxi Driver, this is another classic, great one. It's the perfect gritty 70s vigilante lone wolf narrative, and it's legendary for that. I like it most for how abstract it is, and the way this man in a taxi and these streets of New York become this visual representation and this framework for the lonely, nihilistic psyche at the core. And then you have the Robert De Niro performance, and the Jodie Foster performance, and Sybil Shepard. Sybil Shepard is another one of my personal icons, and she's radiant in this movie. And Bernard Herrmann did the score too, right? It's such a legendary, sad, smooth, jazzy score. And this is another one that really improved upon rewatch for me, so I'm glad I got to do that before I made this video and I'm going to put it up in love. I don't think Raging Bull is on this list anymore, right? It's so crazy that it didn't make the cut this time, especially because I feel like Scorsese only grows more respected with time. Okay, and here's the star of the show, the woman of the hour. Um, this is John Dealman. I'm not even going to say the rest of the title, but this is the movie that famously usurped Vertigo and Citizen Kane, and became the number one movie on this list. I'll come right out and say I don't think this is the best movie ever made. It's not even close for me. For those who don't know about this movie, it's known for being this very long three or four hour movie where we are watching this housewife do chores almost in real time over the course of a few days or a week and that's mostly it. You're watching her prepare food or clean things or go into a room and turn off a light switch, 
things like that. And it is very hypnotic. This was hailed as an early feminist masterwork. It's directed by Chantal Ackerman, who we talked about earlier. I see why it's interesting and why people are making a point to put it on their lists. It's the sort of movie that is, in my opinion, more designed to be talked about, to be referenced, to write an essay about, than something that provides a viewing experience that encapsulates what makes movies so interesting to me. And the reason this movie's placement was somewhat controversial is because it jumped up, I believe, 30 or so slots to take the first place, and this stands in contrast with the history of the Sight and Sound poll, which, as fans may know, was very incremental. I mean, people watched for literally 40 years as Vertigo slowly crept its way up the top 10, like one or two slots at a time, before suddenly taking the top place in 2012. So this is a list that, almost by design, is not supposed to be subject to sudden whims. It's supposed to be, or at least was, something that represented a pretty stalwart, old guard, I guess, opinion. And of course, optically, it caused a commotion that this paragon of feminist cinema surged up to number one, and this brought up a lot of accusations of social justice being the organizing principle behind this list, rather than merit. And this video is long enough, I'm not going to fully get into that right now, but for example, I think Paul Schrader made like a Facebook post talking about how the organizers of the list were putting their thumb on the scale, and people got very mad at him for saying that. But I mean, to be clear, if we're able to level with each other, that is literally exactly what happened. If you look at the article that the BFI put together when they put out the list, they talked about how they doubled their membership this decade with the express purpose of creating a more diverse list. And you can argue about whether that's a good or a bad way to approach a list like this, but saying that the organizers were putting a thumb on the scale is honestly putting it lightly, if anything. I mean, this is like putting a both hands on the scale. So its placement on this list doesn't feel particularly organic to me. I'm also just mad because I'm on the team of a certain movie that it dethroned. But, you know, I guess this will make more people see the movie, and even though it's not my favorite thing ever, I think challenging movies that are contemplative and slow should be consumed by more people. So getting more eyes on this is a net positive. So for its placement, I'm putting it in meh because it has its merits, but I think it's oversold and lacking some of the elements that I love most about movies. Next up, we have another huge, huge work. This is Shoa from Claude Landsman. It is a nine-hour Holocaust documentary, and the distinguishing characteristic here is that it doesn't feature any archival footage or historical recreations. Everything is filmed from the present. So even more than teaching you about the past, it's almost more about the permanence of the event and the remnants of it that still persist in Poland and Germany and, you know, throughout Eastern Europe. I can't even describe how mind-numbing and perspective shifting this movie is. It genuinely leaves you stunned. It's cliche to say, but there are images and moments from this that I will never forget. If anything, the movie could be longer. And it's one of the most incredible things on this list, bar none. I wish more people would see it. I understand why they don't, but I really encourage you to not only watch this movie, but you have to pick a day and watch it in one sitting. I know that sounds very unpleasant and intimidating, and it kind of is, but what you're going to get out of this movie is directly related to you being forced to sit down and stew in this dread and this limbo space for however many hours. So this is another one that is at the very top of the heap. This is definitely going in god tier. So next up we have this movie Daisies, which is a Czechoslovakian movie from the 60s. The whole movie is 
basically this irreverent, elaborate troll. It's about two women, Mia Goth and Cray Sean, as they are bucking societal constraints and just bopping around being mischievous. It's very visually experimental. Parts of it feel very avant-garde. Parts of it feel like a silent slapstick comedy. I think it's a movie that deserves attention because it feels like such an anomaly. I have no idea what was going on culturally in Czechoslovakia in the 60s, but this prankish feminist attitude feels at least a decade or two ahead of its time. Like, at this point, the second wave of the women's movement was barely in its infancy, and this feels like post-second wave, really. So I like the cool punk vision this represents, and I'm gonna put it in good. Then here we have The Night of the Hunter. Famously, this was the first and only movie directed by actor Charles Lawton, and the movie got bad reviews at the time, which discouraged him from making anything else but has since been reevaluated as this great expressionist masterpiece. It all has this biblical storybook fable type tone, and there are great visuals, a lot of high contrast lighting and interesting framing. Mitchum gets all his attention for his villain role here, but Lillian Gish is in it as well, the legendary silent actress in a later career performance. So I like the movie a good deal. There are definitely some shots in here, which if you've seen the movie, I'm sure two or three are popping into your head already, that would rank among the most stunning shots ever put on film. So this is going to go in good. I'm not sure I love it as much as some of its greatest supporters, but it's definitely a movie with a vision. Next, this is O Hazard, Balthazar, another movie from Brisson. I had heard about this movie for so long. It's colloquially known as the movie about the sad donkey that's getting abused. So as a big animal person, I expected that I would be very emotionally affected by it. But I just found this way too austere to really connect to. I don't like when movies are criticized as being boring. I think that's way overused, and I think people need to train their attention spans better, and a lot of times if you're bored, that's your own fault. But this is a movie I would truly call boring. I simply was not interested in it, and by the end, it sort of comes back a little bit, but not enough for me to like it. I want to put this in flop. I know that a lot of people will find that crazy, and I'm open to liking it a lot more if I were to rewatch, but the first go-around just did absolutely nothing for me. Then we have Playtime. This is directed by Jacques Tati, and this movie is so good. There's really nothing like it. I can think of so few other examples where a director's giant, ambitious vision was actually executed to perfection in this way. It's a pretty unconventional movie, too. There isn't a conventional narrative, really. It more views the world as this huge diorama for us to zoom in and out of. And the whole thing comes together as this great thesis on modern life, as it was in the 60s in Paris. Tati is one of the greats. This movie has probably the best production design I've ever seen. The entire thing is one giant Rube Goldberg machine. The sight gags are so sophisticated, and that's my favorite type of comedy when it's done well, and this is pretty much the best it's ever been done. It's easily one of the most impressive, coolest, most joyful, just delightful movies ever made. So we're putting this right up in the very top tier. And then we have Late Spring. This is the first Ozu movie that we're getting to. I watched this one a while ago, so I'm probably due for a revisit, but I do remember it being very emotional. It's the sort of movie that sneaks up on you and hits you like a ton of bricks at the end when you fully click into place what's been happening. It's about a father and a daughter and the daughter's eventual marriage, and it winds up being a very sweet and devastating movie about parental sacrifice and the parent-child relationship. I don't have too much more to add. It's very precisely directed. I think Ozu is someone that I have to dig a little deeper into. I think he's the type of filmmaker where rewatches will 
likely be very rewarding, so I'll get to that one day. For now, we're going to put it in good. Next, we have Do the Right Thing from Spike Lee. I'm going to put this in good as well. This is a movie that has its own brand of specific zippy energy, and I like that about it. I think what's most interesting to me about this movie is that it's hard to make something that is a true Rorschach test for a real-life issue. It's the sort of movie where you can come at it from a lot of different angles and have totally different takeaways based on your viewpoint. And I guess you could probably say that about almost any movie, but I think it's particularly true in this case. And now we're back with another Kurosawa movie, uh, Seven Samurai. We're really going down a list of tried and true classics right now where it's like, I don't even have that much to add to any of these. Seven Samurai, what I always remember the most about it is how well paced it is for an over three hour long movie. It has great characters that you really come to connect to. You see how this movie inspired basically every action movie to come since. So it's a formula that, that you're very used to, but it does it so well that it's almost like you're seeing the formula again for the first time when you watch this. And it keys in on the ultimate loneliness of this hero role in all of these big action movies. So I really like this one. I'm debating between love and good, but for things to be in love, they really have to spark something in me. And I'm not sure if this does. I do like it a lot, though. We're going to put it in good. And now we've got Apocalypse Now from Coppola. I mean, I love this movie. It's terrifying. It's operatic. It's hallucinogenic. Everything that I'm looking for in a movie. You have the very famous napalm Vietnam scene as this guns blazing action centerpiece. And then around it, you have this lazy psychedelic haze going out in both directions. And it's mesmerizing. And then the story of the production is almost as interesting as the movie itself. I'm going to put this in love. The only reason I'm not putting it higher is out of all the movies in this Heart of Darkness genre, for me, Aguirre, The Wrath of God from Werner Herzog is the very top tier. Like, that's my god tier version of Apocalypse Now. And that movie used to be on this list, I believe, and has since fallen off, which is a big mistake. That movie would be in God tier, but I'm slightly less attached to this one, so we're putting this one in love. And then we have another movie that is like on the Mount Rushmore of movies, Persona from Ingmar Bergman. I'm putting this one right up in love too. Fantastic movie, incredibly artistically dense. Like most of the greatest movies on this list. It's the type where I could see myself rewatching it a dozen times throughout my life to fully soak up everything that it has to say, because it's just so hypnotizing. It's a world that you want to keep returning to. Bergman isn't really given the space on this list that you think he would be. Like, I'm sure he has a few movies that pop up under the top 100, but he's the sort of Tarkovsky Hitchcock type that you think would show up here like three or four times. Like, I would potentially put Cries and Whispers up here, The Virgin Spring, I mean, he has so many. And it's also nice to have a movie that genuinely transports you and takes you to this artistic dreamscape experience, but is also like 85 minutes long. You can always count on Bergman for that, and I'm the sort of person where I like a movie to either be under 90 minutes long or like three and a half hours long. I don't want anything in between that. And speaking of a movie that's definitely shorter than 90 minutes, uh, this next one is Meshes of the Afternoon, which is this early 40s surrealist short film. It's like 12 minutes long, I think, and it's directed by Maya Deren. What I do really like about this movie is it does not feel like it was made in the 1940s. It feels decades and decades ahead of its time in that sense. Maybe people aren't going to like this line of thinking, but I don't believe that you can call a 12-minute piece of work one of the best movies ever made. Like, how do you even compare that to a narrative feature? It's just a whole different thing. And this ranks at number 16, which is even more ridiculous. I mean, it's a cool movie. It's this dreamy feedback loop sort of thing. It's fun to watch, but I don't believe that people actually think this is one of the highest achievements in film. So I'm going to put it in flop. Again, I like it well enough. 
on its own, I would give it a positive rating, but I think its appearance on this list, especially as high up as it is, is a little suspect. Oof, I know why maybe most people don't do tier lists for a hundred different things, because this is a marathon. Next up, we have Close Up from Kiara Stami. This is a really weird movie. I'm literally going to like pull out Wikipedia to explain what the plot is because I can barely keep it straight myself. So basically, it's about a man who impersonated a real life director and then lied to a family saying that he was going to put them in a movie that he was directing. And this movie is like a documentary about that incident, but it's also a fictional movie as well with all of the real life people playing their roles and like reenacting moments. It's very trippy and meta. And the whole thing, of course, winds up being this exploration of film as a medium and the nature of fiction versus reality and artifice and how alluring artifice can be, but also how depressing it can be. But this sort of thing just gets so far down the rabbit hole that I, it's too much for me. Maybe I'd like it more if I rewatched it, but this sort of thing is just like a little too intellectualized for my taste. I, I don't know. Kiara Stami in general hasn't been for me so far out of the few things I've seen from him. I can respect what the movie is doing and I'm not going to put it in flop. I'll put it in meh purely because of how original and experimental and bizarre the movie is, but I... it's just not for me. And here we have The Searchers from John Ford. This is a movie that I almost want to like more than I do. What I love about the movie is the landscape and the framing and how majestic and beautiful the whole thing is to look at. And there are a bunch of scenes, especially towards the beginning. I feel like the movie's first half is a lot stronger than the second half. In the first half, there are a handful of scenes that are incredible, like the scene where this family's homestead is under invasion. There are a lot of great moments towards the beginning. I just feel like the tone starts to get a little weird for me in the second half. There are some lighthearted moments and some weird plot detours that just don't really work for me. And I know for many people, this is the greatest movie ever made. And I can see why they're saying that. I definitely understand where they're coming from and what they're getting out of the movie. I just, it doesn't like quite stick the landing for me. Actually, it does stick the landing. Like the last shot is (laughs) the most famous closing movie shot of all time. So it does stick the landing, but it just overall doesn't 100% cohere. I'm going to put it in good though, because what's great is really great. Yeah, we're going to put it in good. And now we have Andrei Rublev. This is the Tarkovsky I've been waiting for. I mean, how much time do we have? This is the type of movie where you finish it and you're like, okay, my outlook on life is different now than it was three hours ago. It sort of fundamentally changed and reinforced a lot of the way that I think about art because it's one of the most beautiful cases for art as a spiritual imperative that... I've ever seen, like art as a conduit for something that is bigger than yourself. And the movie itself is this very long, loose biopic of the titular painter who he's known for these religious paintings. They're in that Byzantine look, like those paintings that have gold leaf all around them. And it's directed by Tarkovsky, so the entire thing is incredible to look at. There's not a single dull shot. And then you get to the ending of this movie and you're like, oh my god. Genuinely one of my favorite endings of all time and one of the most transcendent moments that a movie has ever given me. Like, full jaw on the floor, this is going directly in the god tier. I love looking at all these movies that I put in god tier all in a row together. It's just like so pleasing to my brain. I love all of those movies. Ugh, I have such good taste. Okay, next we have uh, Cleo from 5 to 7, uh, the Agnes Varda movie. This is quintessential French New Wave. Um, We talked about Varda a while ago, and I 
already explained that I like a lot of her movies even better than this one, but this one is really sweet and melancholy, and uh, Corinne Marchand gives a fantastic performance. I love the little movie within the movie. Varda is a really intuitive, fun director to watch. Her movies are just always interesting in that way. I think this will go in good. It's ranked at number 14 on the list, which is kind of high to me. I don't think it's making the grand sweeping sort of statements that I typically look for in my top top movies. But again, it's a very sweet, introspective sort of movie. And this next one is The Passion of Joan of Arc. Uh, this is from Dreyer. This is another one where I'm going to have to sound unsophisticated because this is one of those classic of all classics that everyone regards as such a masterwork. And I'm underwhelmed by it. Falconetti's performance and all of those close-up shots are as breathtaking as they say, but everything other than that I wasn't particularly moved by. And again, with these silent movies, it's looking like I don't like any of them, and I just wish there were ones that I liked on this list. Like, Intolerance used to be on this, and Intolerance is incredible. It would rank very highly if it was still here. And even movies like The Wind, that's a little bit of a lesser seen one. The Wind is fantastic. I wish there were ones that excited me a little more, but I'm gonna put this one in meh. Sorry. And this next one is Piero Le Fou. I hope I pronounced that right. This is the fourth and final movie uh, from Godard on the list. This is his most kooky, kind of playful one that we have here. It really winds up being a movie about Anna Karina and Jean-Paul Belmondo on the run together being crazy, but I really love the look of this movie. It feels almost pop art inspired. There's a heavy emphasis on primary colors, reds and blues and yellows, and I love that sort of graphic look. And it's another one of his movies, like Breathless, that has this distinctly youthful, cool energy to it. And he takes this approach to plot and trope and movie making that feels really elastic, especially for the time. So you have all of these disparate MacGuffin genre elements just crashing together, and it's just a great time. So I'm going to put this, I think, up in love. It's either a high good or a low love, but just me talking and thinking about it, I'm, I'm going to put it up in love. I love the ending, too, and it has some really great posters. I don't know, this one that they chose is kind of ugly, but there are some really cool graphic posters. Moving on, we have The Godfather, the first one. The second one wasn't on this list at all, which is very surprising. It was on the 2012 one, but I think, gun to my head, I prefer the first one, so I'm glad this one made the cut. I've already talked about this movie in my video about 1972. Quick plug, but it's a definitive American movie. I'm going to put this in love, even though it's a movie that I think stands out to people for how dark it is and its violence. To me, it's always felt like an extremely cozy movie in many ways. I love the Italian-American immigrant sensibility, all of this sharp, dynamic family banter. I love all of the suburban homes with the dark wood and the soft lighting and all of the high contrast shots, thanks to Gordon Willis, shout out the cinematographer. It's just such a great vibe, right? Even beyond all of the incredible thematic stuff it's doing with the corruptibility of man and the American dream and all of that. All right, guys, we're pushing our way through. We next have A Brighter Summer Day. This is another Edward Yang movie, but as much as I loved E, I'm equally as unenthusiastic about this movie, which is very strange. I don't know how, out of these two really respected works he has, one I could love so much and the other I could really not like that much, and they're both relatively similar too. But this one is about a boy in Taiwan, I think it's the 60s, and it becomes a bit of a crime drama. He's growing up, but he's also in this childhood gang, and then a bunch of drama ensues. I know people go nuts for this, but I could not really find an entry point into this world that I was interested in. 
If you've made it this far in the video, you can probably tell that I'm not a plot-driven person in movies. I'm not going to be one to get too hung up on story beats or little gripes about character motivations. Like, that's not my thing. It never has been. I view watching a movie more like the way you'd look at a painting. I view it as this holistic, mind-expanding sort of experience. So that said, I don't typically do well with this sort of sprawling crime narrative where people are shifting allegiances and different groups are doing different things. Like, my brain just isn't really built for it. I start getting confused about, like, what's what, and then I just sort of tune out. Which is not to say that I tuned out of this movie. I just could never fully connect with it. I also feel like there was definitely some geopolitical thematic stuff going on, which totally went over my head because I know nothing about Taiwan. So I can appreciate the movie a bit for the impressionistic portrait of a kid's life that it creates, but I didn't like it. <laughs> so I'm putting it in flop. Oh, and now we have Sunrise. I totally forgot that this movie would be coming up. I love Sunrise. Uh, we're going to put it straight in love. I think this movie is fantastic, and it's really thrilling to watch it, especially at the point that it comes in movie history as things are starting to transition to sound. The way that this abstracts the medium of a silent movie, it's just so great, and it kind of makes you sad because silent movies were getting so good in the late 20s. I mean, they were good before that too, but there are so many great ones in the late 20s, and you almost just wish that there was like another decade or something before a talkies came around because really cool things were happening. The brief plot here is that there's a couple that are growing apart, and then something big happens and it shifts the entire narrative. And I almost see it in this meta way where these characters come together to alter the predestined story that's been put in front of them. And we get a really touching, life-affirming second act because of it. Some of the shots and moments in this movie, a lot of it takes place in a city and at this elaborate fairground, and some of the imagery is just mind-blowing. So I have no complaints, and it's really heartening to see it this high up on the list, too. It's at number 11, which, given some of the stuff that these voters are doing in this, this decade's poll, I'm glad to see that a movie like this is still, you know, getting the respect it deserves. And next we have another old one. This is The Rules of the Game from Jean Renoir. And this is another one that's ranked very highly. It's number 13. I'm not exactly on the same page with most people about this one. I did like it when I watched it, but it isn't something that has stuck with me at all. It's kind of a class-based, big ensemble drama about aristocrats and servants at this chateau for a weekend. It feels very contemporary, so that aspect is impressive. And there are a couple great performances. Uh, Renoir himself is in the movie, and he's fantastic. I think I need to rewatch it, and I would almost certainly move up on it. So I'll get around to a rewatch one day, and then I'll look back at this and probably hate myself for putting it so low but I'm putting it in meh for now. If something doesn't grab and excite my brain immediately, I can't in good conscience put it too high up. I'm just living my truth. Next we have Black Girl. So this is a movie from, I believe, the 60s. It's shot in Africa, at least partially, and it's about an African woman who becomes a housekeeper for this wealthy French family and moves in with them, and it's about her experience from there on. I think it's fine. It's a little slight. I, I believe it's an hour long. It's very allegorical, very film school. I'm sure thousands of students have gotten really great grades on essays about colonialism citing this movie. It's well shot. I remember there being like this recurring mask motif that is effective. I think overall... I'm gonna put this in meh. It's like a high meh, but a meh nonetheless. And here's another one of the more conventional studio system choices. We have Singing in the Rain. This movie jumped way up, I believe, this time, and now it's sitting at number 10, which is really high. I'm not opposed to it 
per se. I just don't really get why now it's rising. Like, what happened between 2012 and 2022 that made this movie more well-respected? It's great. It's one of the essential Hollywood musicals. I love Gene Kelly, Debbie Reynolds. The standout to me is Donald O'Connor. That one number he has is fantastic. And Oh, Gene Hagen, duh, she like steals the show. And ultimately, this is another one of the movies on this list that is about movie making and about artifice. And it's a cool movie in that it's simultaneously giving viewers a little piece of Hollywood history, right? The transition from silent movies to talkies. So I love this movie. I'm going to put it in good. It's a very high good. I do wish that there was more room on this list for these classic Hollywood spectacle technicolor moments like where is the wizard of oz the fact that gone with the wind isn't on this list almost disqualifies it in its entirety where is meet me in st louis where is ben hur i mean there are so many fantastic options that i wish were on this list but you know i'm definitely not going to turn my nose up at singing in the rain either this next movie I am obsessed with. This is Man with a Movie Camera, the Soviet experimental documentary from the 20s. And I think I might have teased that I really like this movie when we were talking about Battleship Potemkin, so here's your payoff two hours later. But I'm surprised that something so old and abstract has managed to remain in the top 10 of this list. It, it gives me hope. The concept of the movie is that it takes us through a day in Moscow and cross-cuts the actions of individual people with the actions of busy crowds, with the actions of new machinery and technology, and it just becomes this giant symphony of the day in the life of a city. And I just will never forget the first time I saw this. It speaks so much to the human artistic spirit and the fact that already in the 20s, someone was being this bold and this creative with the concept of what a movie can be and what it can portray is so enthralling to me and makes me so happy about humanity and about the medium as a whole. As the movie goes on and it switches from locale to locale and all these different editing techniques are being used, it really feels like something new is being invented in front of you on screen. Like you're feeling emotions that you imagine people must not have ever felt before when seeing a movie. So it's something that almost through sheer force of how formally exciting it is, it becomes pretty emotional. So this is easily going in the very top tier. And it's one that I'm really going to recommend that people check out. When I first heard about it, I was thinking, okay, Soviet documentary showing a day in the life of workers in the 20s, like, this is going to be boring. This sounds like that Andy Warhol movie that just shows a still frame of the Empire State Building for eight hours. But no, this is something very modern and very thrilling. Now, here we have our first Lynch movie. It's kind of crazy that we've gotten this far into it and are just now getting to the first Lynch movie because he shows up a couple times here. Mulholland Drive is a legendary. Even in 2012, it was one of the very few contemporary movies to make it on the list. And I think it's deserved. I think it's one of the more visionary, singular pieces of work of the past, you know, 20, 30 years. I really love David Lynch, and he's another person on this list like Agnes Varda for me, where I love a lot of their movies, and I just have this little annoyance for myself that I don't think their best movies were chosen. Like, the most impactful Lynch movies for me are Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me and Twin Peaks The Return. I'm not sure if that fully counts as a movie, but I believe it's lower on this list, so it counted for them. And Eraserhead, even, is a huge one. So I'm putting Mulholland Drive in love because I love the movie, but I just get like a little bit sad because he has other movies that I like even more that I would put even higher, but I'm glad this one's on the list, and I do think it being number eight is too high, but you know, enough time has passed since it came out that I'll accept it. I don't think that's a crazy statement to make. And you know, while we're doing Lynch, I guess why don't we skip the line a little bit and cover Blue Velvet as well? We're getting towards the end of the list, you know, let's, let's get crazy. Um, Blue Velvet I like less than Mulholland Drive. I know that Blue Velvet is probably his quintessential work, maybe Twin Peaks as a project is, but as far as movies, Blue Velvet is sort of his magnum opus in a lot of ways. 
I like the movie. I think it's undeniably one of the more influential movies of the past 40 years or so. Like, it kind of pioneered the new wave of, you know, something weird and disturbed and perverted is going on in these nice, pleasant picket fence suburbs. And that's an idea that's been really ran into the ground and it was tackled by so many directors. I mean, I'm thinking about like happiness to American Beauty to, you know, Little Children, all of these types of movies. And Isabella Rossellini is one of my all-time greats. And this is such an amazing performance. You just can't look away from it. So I'm going to put the movie in good overall. Again, it's just not personally my favorite Lynch. I think Mulholland Drive is better. And I think he has a few others not on this list that are also better, but you know, it's Blue Velvet. It's a modern classic. And then we have Beau Travail from Claire Denis. This is another one of those more recent movies that shot up insanely high. It was towards the bottom of the list in 2012, and now it's at number seven. So I don't need to keep going on. You know how I feel about that. But this is one that I really love. So I'm not as mad about it. It's the type of thing where even if you aren't being totally floored by all the thematic stuff that's going on, like I am, you can also really appreciate it just on a visual level. Like, it's designed for you to just stare at with all of these sharp colors and landscapes and how deliberate and contemplative it is. But at its core, it's all about masculinity and jealousy and homoeroticism and all of the complicated, you know, staring at yourself in a mirror type feelings that you'll find therein. And that's my bread and butter. That's exactly the type of thing that I love in a movie. So this is fantastic. And the ending, duh, it's like literally sublime. I think we're going to put this in love. It's a very high love. I feel like if I were to rewatch it, it would probably bump up to God tier. But for now, we're going to keep it in love. It's such a great poster too. And then we have In the Mood for Love. This is another one of those that shot up into the top 10 this time. Three movies from the 21st century in the top 10 confirms my worries that people aren't maybe delving into the past as much as they should and are sticking with more comfortable movies that are from their time and therefore more familiar to them. And I think that's a mistake. Most of the best movies are in the past. But regardless, this is a big movie and everyone's obsessed with this. Right off the bat, I'll say I like Chunking Express better. I think this movie is a little bit overrated, especially at number five on the list, but it does have some moments that are just perfect and amazing. It's a movie about longing and about <laughs> making the most beautiful shots possible. For me, the defining image of this movie is Maggie Chung in those multi-patterned dresses. They're just impossibly tailored and gorgeous, and they feel almost reflective of the movie and of her emotion as a whole. Like, all these bold patterns that are exploding out of her, but also encasing and constricting her at the same time. So I do like a lot of what's going on, and I'm really with the movie for the first good chunk of it, but I do feel that towards the end it starts losing me a little bit. I don't really love the ending or like the last act as a whole. So I think I'm going to put this in meh. Again, I don't dislike the movie. It just wouldn't appear on my list at all. Whereas, you know, Chunking Express would. Okay. I'm realizing that basically the entire top 10 of this list is showing up one after the other here. So this is another one. This is Tokyo Story from Ozu. It's consistently ranked very high on this list and has been for a while. It's number four this decade. And I definitely respect this movie and I liked it when I watched it, but it didn't leave any sort of lasting impression or impact on me, which is surprising for something that is consistently this acclaimed. Maybe it's the sort of thing that hits you harder when you're older, because for those who don't know, the movie is about a couple very old parents who come to Tokyo to visit their kids who are now like of adult age, and essentially the kids have no time for the parents, and it's about the modern world and family relationships and generational divides and that sort of thing. So maybe it's more salient as you age. The movie itself is very evocative, and it'll make you sad, I will say that. I'm feeling either meh or good for this, and I know meh is going to make me look crazy, but I think we'll put it in meh for now and 
I'll see how I'm feeling at the end. Like, I just compare it to the two movies that are coming up, and those excite me so much more and speak more to my taste, so that's where I'm coming at this from. So this next one has a weird poster, but it's 2001, A Space Odyssey from Stanley Kubrick. This is that level of emeritus movie that feels almost ridiculous to talk about, but I love 2001. It's probably my favorite Kubrick, you know, scorching hot take on my end. There are just so many individual parts of this movie that I love, and yet it's still able to come together and feel greater than the sum of its parts in the end. Like the part on the spaceship with Hal, which is maybe the most famous part, is one of the tightest, scariest one-act thrillers ever. But then you also have that part in the first half that almost feels like a glamorous, perfect, you know, 60s space age travelogue. And then you also get the caveman part at the beginning, which is so cool. And it's all wrapped up in this cosmic, you know, metaphysical journey through history and time and space. And it's all so psychedelic and terrifying. And you just have to sit back in awe at the entirety of this movie. So it being this high is extremely well-deserved. We're going to put it all the way up in God tier. Wait, side note, I'm looking at the movies we have left, and they didn't put Citizen Kane on this list. I put trust in the good users of TierMaker.com, and look what I get. Okay, at the end, we'll we'll do our own little makeshift ranking, and I'll, I'll add in a little picture for it. Here's the moment that I have been waiting for throughout this whole process. I'm so excited to get to talk about Vertigo, because Vertigo, I think I've mentioned a couple times so far, is notorious for climbing its way up the list over a few decades and then topping the list in 2012, usurping Citizen Kane, and this was a big moment, and then this year getting demoted to number two. And this upset me because I think Vertigo might be the best movie ever made. My personal number one favorite changes constantly. I don't think I really have one. But if we're talking the best... I think Vertigo is one of the very, very, very few movies I can think of that is making a grand enough artistic statement to lay claim to that title. Because it's not just a movie that is detailing someone else's psyche to you or showing you a particular aesthetic or a story. It's really an entire new world unto itself. Like, it's this total otherworldly dream limbo space that you enter when you watch this movie. And it's the sort of thing where rewatches are not just helpful, but essential to really getting to the core of this movie and how deep it goes. And I don't think I'm even there yet necessarily, but I've seen it probably three or four times, and I think the first time you watch it, especially if you watch it first when you're young, you see it as just another Hitchcock thriller, and any claim to it being the best movie ever made seems sort of bizarre to you. And then maybe you watch it a second time and you get a better sense that the plot of the movie is almost a pretext, and it's really all about obsession and pathology and artifice. But then the more times you continue watching it, the world just starts to envelop you and you almost start to crave rewatching it. And then you're better able to see the ways that this movie is almost like a simulation space that's meant to emulate and deconstruct what a movie is. And by doing that, you're able to look at the role of director and audience from a completely new angle. Like, you start to notice more that elements like the movie's score or, you know, the colors being placed in the frame a certain way are conscious manipulations the same way that Jimmy Stewart is manipulating the object of his obsession, Kim Novak. So you see Hitchcock manipulating the world the same way that Jimmy Stewart within the movie is manipulating his world. And then this brings up the idea that Kim Novak and her character Judy are maybe something of an audience surrogate, right? Being, you know, shaped and molded and warped by this unseen eye of the director. But then by the same token, we are also sort of placed in the Jimmy Stewart role as Uh, these voyeurs, these people projecting emotion and meaning onto, you know, the character of Judy. And then this perfectly constructed little world begins to 
collapse in on itself. So I don't know if that was easy to follow or if I'm just babbling, but you can really follow that line of thinking and just go down this continuous spiral after spiral after spiral, just like, you know, the movie poster. And it's just this mind melting experience that's simultaneously alluring and scary and beautiful and almost exhausting, which is why I think it's Hitchcock's best work, because it builds up everything that he does so well, so perfectly, only to completely flip the script, deconstruct it all, break it down, build it back up, re-examine it, pull the curtain back. Like, it's, there's so much going on. So this is why I'm partially mad about the number one spot, because I think almost nothing can hold a candle to Vertigo. So this is definitely easily going in the very top tier. And just to make a point as a ceremonial gesture, uh, we're going to put it at the very top, where it belongs. So this next one has a tough act to follow, and this is A Matter of Life and Death from Powell and Pressburger. And those two are great. They fall into that category that I've been creating as we've gone through this, where I think they are on the list an appropriate amount of times, but for the wrong movies, maybe. Like, I would put Black Narcissus on this list in a second. I would particularly put Peeping Tom, which Pressburger wasn't involved in that one, that's just Michael Powell, but I would put Peeping Tom on this list in a second. I don't love A Matter of Life and Death too much. I think it starts out extremely strong. It's about a World War II pilot who accidentally survives a plane crash, and then angels try to make him come back to heaven. So it's very fantastical, and the first act in particular has so many great memorable scenes. The first scene where the plane is actually crashing is breathtaking, and then you move into heaven, which has some of the best production design ever, and is just one of the most impressive aesthetic visions I've ever seen. But then as the movie goes on, I feel like it starts to lose a little steam, it gets a little bit plotty, and then the ending becomes this grand political allegory, which is not particularly interesting to me. So overall, I don't leave with as great an impression as I would like to. So overall, we're putting this in meh. Again, I'm grading them on a bit of a curve, like this is one of their less interesting movies, in my opinion, so it's gonna go down here, but you know, don't worry, they have another one coming up as well. And then we have our last real silent movie, Modern Times. So I've already talked about Chaplin and the fact that uh, I'm a little hot and cold with him. I don't get too much out of this movie. There's a few really iconic moments, but I don't know, I'm just not too sold. I love Paulette Goddard. I think she's a definite standout here. She's always great. She and Chaplin were married, actually, I think at the time, uh, but definitely at some point. So yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe on a rewatch I'd like it more. I feel like that's always my excuse when I'm not really into something, but I'm gonna put it in meh. I don't think it reaches the heights that City Lights does, for example, so we can't put it in that same tier. And next we have a really fun one. This is Celine and Julie Go Boating, directed by Jacques Rivette. This is a movie that I came to on my own outside of the context of this list, and I love it. And then when I saw that it made it on, I was like, oh, that's kind of weird and random, but I'm happy about it. I think it's a really inventive and fun movie, so its inclusion is a pleasant surprise. The plot is very hard to explain, but involves these two women who meet and become friends, and they get involved in this domestic mystery, and the scenes wind up replaying themselves over and over, and you wind up in this crazy feedback loop about art and storytelling, and it just like spins out, and it's so fun. So it's very meta and surreal, and you just have a great time with it. And these two women are wonderful. It's like probably one of the best portrayals of female friendship that I've ever seen on screen. And this is like an awful and reductive comparison, but you can really trace so much of modern pop culture, like anything that's even somewhat in the broad city type of mode, to these two women in their relationship. So yeah, this is just a lovely, great time. And I love this poster too. We're gonna put this in love. Then we have our last appearance of Billy Wilder on this list. This is Sunset Boulevard. This is a fantastic movie. It's 
a great noir, it's a great Hollywood satire, it's great writing, great performances, so we're checking a bunch of boxes here. There are so many legendary moments, legendary shots that have been parodied and reparodied and repackaged over and over and over to this day, and Gloria Swanson is giving her wonderful meta performance. So we're going to put it in good overall. You already heard my spiel that I went on a little earlier about Billy Wilder and how I think he's maybe a little overrepresented on this list. And when I see something like Sunset Boulevard here, I'm like, okay, that's great, but where is like All About Eve, for example? And I know that's outside of the scope of what I'm supposed to be evaluating here, but the two movies are sort of inextricably tied in my head just because they both came out in 1950. They're both playing around with the idea of Hollywood. Betty Davis and Gloria Swanson were notoriously both up for the same Oscar that year, which they then both lost. I think of the movies in the same breath, basically. So when I see Sunset Boulevard here, I'm like, that's so great. But why isn't your taller, prettier, more talented twin sister here too? But, you know, what are you going to do? It's still a great movie. And now we're finally getting into one of the animated selections on this list. We have uh, Spirited Away from Miyazaki. So Miyazaki got two movies into this top 100 list this time. And I guess we can talk about them both at once. I like Spirited Away well enough. I remember it being very scary as a kid and then watching it as an adult. It's doing this sort of grand epic hero's journey type narrative and a lot of the imagery is very iconic and has stood the test of time. I'm just not sold on either of these movies being on the list, to be honest. If we're going to include a couple animated movies, I think something like Akira would maybe be more appropriate, that feels more daring and expansive and mature to me, or maybe one of the early Walt Disney classics like a Fantasia or a Snow White or a Bambi, those only get better as you get older because you start to see them more as these soundscape masterpieces. But for these, I'm like, okay, I see the angle for uh, My Neighbor Totoro a little more because I get the slice of life, peaceful childhood nostalgia and melancholy. So I do think that one is more my speed if I had to pick a favorite. But I want to put both of these in meh because they just don't excite me that much. Then we have Sancho the Bailiff. This is another movie from Mizuguchi who also did Ugetsu, which we talked about. It feels like eight hours ago at this point. If you remember, I love him. So this is a very good movie. It probably feels like his most operatic narrative. So I understand why it's here. I do think that he has a lot of other movies that I would put on here before that one. Like I think The Life of Oharu is great and The Story of the Last Chrysanthemum is great. I would put those above this one. But again, I see why this one is here. It's about a mother and two kids in Japan who are separated and sold into slavery. So we have a lot of Mizuguchi's tried and true themes about a poverty and despair going on. And it's sad and it's touching and just a very well-told story. So I'm going to put this in good. It doesn't hold a candle to Ugetsu to me, and we are retreading some similar thematic content, but uh, it's still very good. And then we have our only Douglas Sirk movie on the list. This is Imitation of Life. This is a melodramatic a sort of soapy story about two mothers, one black, one white, and their children, and the way their lives progress with a bunch of commingling plot threads. This is an interesting one to include on the list. I feel like I don't see people talking about this movie too much, so it's another inclusion that feels a little bit random to me, like out of Douglas Sirk's entire filmography we're picking this one. It feels a little arbitrary, but sure, I think he deserves to be on the list in some capacity. There are a lot of really great performances in this. Juanita Moore in particular is so good. Sandra D as well, Lana Turner. I really enjoy it just on the level of this is a sort of genre that doesn't really exist anymore, or maybe it would it would now be like a mini series, like a, a Mildred Pierce sort of thing. But these gauzy, dignified women's stories, I love that sort of thing. But I would feel a lot better about like All That Heaven Allows being on this list. I think that movie is significantly more successful. I want to put this in 
meh. I know I've been talking and I, I like the movie, as I've said, but I just get annoyed when these directors are given their one representative slot on the list, and I think it's for the wrong movie. Here we have Journey to Italy. This is a Rossellini movie about a couple, Ingrid Bergman and George Sanders, as their marriage is quietly falling apart. It's very moody, very ennui-driven. This came out in the 50s, and what's most striking to me when I watch it is how much it feels like an Antonioni movie, and his great movies in this same vein would come out in the 60s with La Ventura, which we talked about, and La Note, and all these things, and this really feels like almost a practice run for the stuff that he would perfect. And since I love Antonioni, I also like this movie a lot. It's honestly, I think, my favorite Ingrid Bergman performance ever. I feel like she maybe doesn't get singled out for this movie all that much. I feel like people would go to like Casablanca or Gaslight or Autumn Sonata or something. But this movie, she is so good, like just so precise. And I mean, the entire movie is her face, basically. So I'm a little torn between good or meh. Like, it does feel a little bit like an unformed, pre-evolved version of a lot of the movies in the next decade that I would love a lot. But I mean, at the same time, this one came first, so I have to give credit where credit's due. So I think we're gonna put it in good. We're really closing in on the end now. So this is La Jete from Chris Marker, who also did Sans Soleil, which we talked about earlier. It's very avant-garde and experimental, and the movie's calling card, I guess, is that it is not told through video. It's told instead through a series of photos, and it becomes this meditation on memory and time, and it's very intellectual and heady and interesting and all these things. But what I really take away from it and what keeps me thinking about it is this distinction between photo and video, because it forces you to consider what the difference really is between the two, because we know that videos are just a succession of photos happening very quickly, right? Like, however many frames per second. But when this movie uses still frames and is cutting out the movement in between, it is warping the medium in a way that is just very jarring and interesting. And I mean, it's just still frames, so I don't know what I'm freaking out about, but I don't know, it's just a very surprising, unexpected way to tell the story, and it is very effective, I think. So I'm going to put this in good, and I think everyone should go watch this. It's a great way to spend 30 minutes. I mean, there's no excuse not to, right? And then, this is not the last movie, by the way, remember, we have to add in Citizen Kane at the end, but this is The Red Shoes, again from Powell and Pressburger. I always associate this movie with Scorsese, just because I know he's obsessed with it and mentions it all the time. It's a story that's based on a fairy tale about a ballerina and a pair of red shoes, and it's all about artistic obsession. And you're mostly watching this for the whole production and craft of it all. It's one of the most gorgeous, colorful movies ever made. There's this giant, like, 10-minute dance sequence in the middle that's, I mean, just incredible. It's just like this unmatched style that Powell and Pressburger are known for, and I don't think anyone has ever been exactly able to recreate. So the movie belongs on the list for that alone. I'm between love and good here. I'm going to put it in good just because, like I said, I'm trying to save those top two tiers for things that are really special to me in some way, but it's a great movie. I mean, if you've made it this far into the video, I'm assuming you've probably seen The Red Shoes already, but if not, you really should. I, I think it's Moira Shearer is the name of the main actress, and she's fantastic too. Her performance is another standout element for sure. All right, and now we are finally at the last movie on this list. We have the number three movie ever made, according to the poll, Citizen Kane from Orson Welles. And I don't know if this is a good one to end on because it's so notorious or a bad one to end on because I don't have any thrilling take to give. I love Citizen Kane. I think it's a fantastic movie. To me, it's one of the definitive American things. Like, I think this movie is so woven into our national identity in a lot of 
subliminal ways even, because it's this incredible statement about ambition and man's search for meaning, which has all only become exponentially more relevant as the decades go by. But I think what's coolest about this movie is the way that it mixes genres. Like, there's a good portion of it that is that satirical march of time kind of pseudo-documentary thing, and that's great. Then it's almost a bit like a noir. It's expressionistic. It's a mystery. It's just constantly surprising you and playing around with the confines of how you would typically think this sort of story would be told. And I don't even have to talk about how well it's shot or any of the craft elements. Like, it goes without saying that this is such an impeccably made movie as well. So I'm going to put this in love. It's like a high love, honestly. This is another movie where I totally understand why there's a contingent of people that call it the best movie of all time. Like, it's doing so much, it does it all flawlessly, and I definitely think it's worth a rewatch too if you maybe saw it for the first time when you were a little younger and maybe didn't understand why it's so well respected. I was sort of the same way, but when you watch it with a little more of a mature brain, I guess, it only gets better. And there we have it. I mean, this is the full list. I think right now I'm going to switch around a couple things and then check back in. Nothing too drastic, but I'll like make my little tweaks because I want to make sure that I'm feeling good about this. Okay, I moved a couple things around. I still don't know how I'm feeling about it. I mean, I could just tweak this all day long and at some point we just got to call it. So there we have it. And for the record, within each tier, there's no hierarchy. I could do that, but it would take like two hours for me to actually decide. So we're just going to leave it as these five tiers, set it and forget it. I guess while we're here, you know, what's another five minutes on this fucking three hour long video? I'll just give a few of the most glaring movies that I think should be on this list. I know that I've alluded to them throughout, but we'll just do a quick rundown. To me, the most glaring things are Gone with the Wind should not only be on the list, but be very high. The same goes for Titanic. These are both like inexcusable omissions. Aguirre, The Wrath of God should be here. It used to be here and is no longer. That's a mistake. Intolerance from D.W. Griffith is another one that used to be here and absolutely still should be. There should be some good Fassbender movies on this list. I think The Marriage of Maria Braun is the one that I would pick if I had to choose just one. There should be more Antonioni's, I would say Red Desert and La Note in particular, but you know, so many others like La Strada, Brief Encounter, Ben-Hur, Cabaret, A Streetcar Named Desire, All About Eve. There are just a ton. And even things like Chinatown and Nashville used to be on this list and have since been taken off. Like, what are we doing, people? You know, Network, Giant, Belle de Jour, King Kong. I mean, I could go on forever. But all that said, if you're still here, I'm genuinely shocked. Thank you for sitting through all this. I hope you found it interesting. Let me know if there's anything that you're planning to seek out now that you've watched this video. That would be really cool, honestly. And also let me know what you think about the direction this list is going in as a whole. I'm sure anyone who was going to comment on that sort of thing already has, but I'm curious to get people's thoughts on that. And also let me know if there are any other big lists or something like that you would like me to talk about. I, I'm only doing this one because it's actually prestigious. Like I have no interest in doing like the letterbox top 200 or anything like that. But if there are any other interesting, weird lists that you'd like me to check out or think about, let me know. But otherwise, I will see you in the next video.